This video is brought to you by Squarespace. From websites and online stores to marketing tools and analytics, Squarespace is the ultimate all-in-one platform to build a beautiful online presence and run your business. You can check out Squarespace through the link in the description below. More about them in a bit. It was the era of great East Asian authoritarians. Up in China, Mao Zedong clung to power. In South Korea, Park Chung-hee oh, was mixing economic progress with an iron fist. In the Philippines and Indonesia, corrupt kleptocrats Ferdinand Marcos and Suharto were plundering the nation's treasuries, to say nothing of the madhouse in North Korea. It was a time of strongmen, of powerful rulers who dominated their nations. Yet not all of them would be awful. On a tiny island at the south of the Malay Peninsula, one man would forge a different kind of regime, a hybrid that would mix authoritarianism with democracy, oppressive laws with staggering wealth, free market capitalism with state control. Known as Lee Kuan Yew, he would create modern Singapore. Coming to power at the end of the colonial era, Lee inherited a Singapore still ruined by war and riven with poverty and ethnic divisions. Yet he somehow managed to transform it into one of the richest, safest nations on earth. Controversial in his methods, brilliant in his results, this is the story of Singapore's father. Given that he's now famous for championing Singaporean independence, it can be a surprise to discover just how much Lee Kuan Yew benefited from British rule. When he was born on September 16, 1923, it wasn't into a world of poverty and oppression, but into a family embedded among the colonial elite. As a fourth generation straight Chinese, the Lees were part of an ethnic group who'd come to control the British colony decades before, mixing their culture with that of both the local Malay and the ruling British. For Lee, that meant growing up in a mostly English-speaking environment. Until he was an adult, nearly everyone he knew called him Harry Lee. It also meant growing up in relative comfort. With his solidly middle-class parents, Lee was able to attend the Raffles Institution, an elite school named after the port city's British founder. But while he was certainly pampered, young Harry Lee wasn't just coasting through life. Although undoubtedly part of the elite, the boy's family came from the lower rungs of the privileged ladder, less the 1% and more the struggling to get into the 1%. This gave him a drive many of his peers lacked, a drive to prove his worth. When Lee graduated in 1939, it wasn't just at the head of his class, but ahead of any other student in the whole colony of British Malaya. It was a vintage piece of Lee Kuan Yew, a combination of searing intelligence, extreme determination, but also a desire to show off, to prove he was better than anyone else. And it worked. That fall, Lee planned to go to study at a prestigious university in England, just the first step on a short staircase that would take him to the top of the colonial administration. But you know what they say about the best laid plans of mice and men? While the arrival of World War II was about to do to Lee's plans, what a sadistic cat does to a helpless mouse. The eruption of conflict in Europe forced the ambitious young man to stay put in Singapore, trading England's green and pleasant land for a scholarship at Raffles College. It wasn't all a bust, it was while studying that Lee met his future wife, law student Kwa Gyok Chu. On the other hand, it also meant that he was still in Singapore in early 1942 when the Japanese Imperial Army came rolling in. The Battle of Singapore began on February the 8th after the fall of mainland British Malay. By now, the colonial authorities had destroyed the bridges to the islands and concentrated their forces of tens of thousands of troops. With the added advantage of a defensive ring of heavy guns, they theoretically could have kept the Japanese at bay. In the end, though, they barely managed to hold them off for a week. Despite an order from Churchill to keep fighting, Singapore's governor surrendered on February the 15th at which point the Imperial Army did what it did best and launched a campaign of mass murder. As a straight Chinese, the Japanese occupation was an odd time for Lee. On the one hand, the Japanese were actively hunting down and killing Chinese people on the islands. One time, Lee was nearly caught by a death squad. Another, he was interrogated and humiliated. On the other hand, he was also part of the elite. The Japanese still needed to run their new territory. Once the chaos of the invasion was over, family connections managed to get him a job at the imperial news agency, Demay, where he quickly learned Japanese. What he was really doing there remains uncertain. In the closing days of the war, Lee was suddenly forced to go into hiding. It's been speculated that he was passing information on to British intelligence and may have been discovered. Whatever the truth, Lee managed to stay underground until the danger had passed. On the 12th of September 1945, British forces liberated at Singapore, yet Lee didn't exactly welcome them back with open arms. The easy surrender of Singapore had left many on the islands with a bitter taste in their mouths. From seeing himself as part of the colonial elite, Lee had now gone to seeing the Brits as people who'd abandoned his home 
in its hour of need. As Lee himself later wrote, the war had left him determined that no one, neither the Japanese nor the British, had the right to push and kick us around. Although Lee came out of World War II distinctly unimpressed with Singapore's overlords, that didn't mean he was entirely done with Britain. After working in the post-war black markets for a year, he'd pulled together enough cash to get a boat to England to take up his studies. For four years, he'd live at the heart of the empire. It was an experience that would transform his life. As Lee quickly found out, Britain was somehow both more or less than he'd imagined during his colonial childhood. On the one hand, he developed a deep love for the rolling hills of the West Country and life among the money delete. On the other hand, he soon discovered that his hosts could be unbelievably racist. So rude were so many people to this Asian man walking among them that any remaining scales fell from Lee's eyes. As he later noted, I saw no reason why they should be governing me. They're not superior. Still, it wasn't all bad times. While in England, Lee finally married Kwa Gyok Cho. More significantly for our story, though, he also got deeply involved in politics. This was the era of the Attlee Labour government, perhaps the most left-wing in British history. Helping the party campaign in Totnes for the 1950 election, Lee began to drink in its ideas, to take on board its great plans for social housing, for establishing powerful state monopolies. When he returned to Singapore, he'd carry them back with him, tucked up carefully in his heart, alongside the anti-colonial ideas that he'd picked up mixing with African and Indian students. While the left-wing politics seemed a natural fit for Lee. Back in Singapore, he resumed his life among the moneyed class, a young wealthy lawyer who loved golf and fancy cars. But Lee was deeply aware that left-wing politics could also mean something more than just wealth redistribution, a chance to stick it to the colonial administration. Over the next few years, Lee honed his oratory, addressing strikers and defending activists in the courts, developing a punchy street fighting style. Yet he took care to keep his distance from those who actually threw punches. Lee, you see, felt activism had to come second to law and order, especially given the rise of communism. The 1949 creation of the People's Republic of China had turned a generation of Singaporean Chinese into hardcore red activists, activists determined to win Singapore's increasing number of elected seats. By now, Li was acutely aware that he'd need some of this vast Chinese population on his side if he ever wanted to win elections. But he also detested communism. His solution? The People's Action Party. Formed in 1954, PAP was a shotgun marriage between Singapore's anglicized left-wingers and the Chinese-speaking communists who actually wanted to get into power. From Lee's perspective, though, it was also a way for him to appeal to local Chinese voters who might otherwise regard him as unacceptably close to Britain. To help sell his credentials, he brushed up on Mandarin, learned Hokkien. Then, just for the heck of it, he also learned Tamil. By the time of 1955 election, Lee was able to appeal directly to all of Singapore's major ethnic groups in their own tongue be they Chinese, Malay, or Indian. It was a stupendous feat of learning. Sadly, though, it wasn't enough. That year, PAP lost out to Singapore's other major left-wing party, the Labour Front. But what was bitterly disappointing on that night soon turned out to be a blessing. Ruling as a minority government, Labour Front lost control of the striking workers, causing Britain to pause Singapore's timetable for decolonization. Paranoid this was all the fault of communist agitators, Labour Front launched a brutal crackdown targeting the Chinese. The result? An unpopular government that also did lead the massive favor of kneecapping his communist rivals in PAP. By the time of the 1959 election, the once divided party was largely under its control. The results that May were a blowout for PAP, netting them all but eight of the 51 contested seats. Just a few days later, on June 3, 1959, the British surrendered internal control of the island. At age 35, Lee Kuan Yew became the first Prime Minister of Singapore. Yet the Wunderkins had no intention of leading his island to complete independence. Instead, the PAP had run on a specific platform, one of taking Singapore fully out of British control and into federation with Malaysia. The fulfillment of that plan would soon become Lee's greatest triumph and his darkest nightmare. All right, we'll get back to today's video in just a minute, but first, a quick word from today's video sponsor, Squarespace. You know what's great about the summer? Vacation, time off, a little bit of R&R. &R. It's the perfect time to spend on the beach, daydreaming about that next project that you want to work on. Fortunately, Squarespace gives you every possible tool you might want to get started with that next project. Whether it's a small business, a sports blog, a creative portfolio, or just a page full of dank memes, it doesn't matter. If you can dream it, you can build it with with Squarespace. 
If you're looking to get in and out quick without thinking too much about what your website should look like, bam, use one of their quick and beautiful templates to make a website that's fresh and for you. Or maybe you're more the hands-on person, you've got lots of opinions and ideas about what exactly your site should look like. Well, Squarespace gives you all of the customization options you could ever want. No updates, no patches, no technical BS to worry about. And once you're done setting up your website, tinkering with the design if you're so inclined, or maybe playing with the colors, there are so many extra features that Squarespace provides so your website can thrive. Email campaigns, patronage portals, social integrations, member-only areas, analytics, commercial options, 24-7 customer support, really everything you need is in one place. So when you're ready to get started, go to squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch your new site, go to squarespace.com dot com forward slash biographics to save 10 percent off your first purchase of a website or a domain and now back to it so here's something you need to know about singapore it really shouldn't exist at a little over 700 square kilometers it's a quarter of the size of rhode island it's home to an ethnic mix with no natural shared language or culture, plus a host of different religions. It's also resource poor, without even enough water to sustain itself. As Lee himself put it, long after it somehow made this impossible state work, to understand Singapore and why it is what it is, you've got to start off with the fact that it's not supposed to exist and cannot exist. We don't have the ingredients of a nation, the elementary factors, a homogenous population, common language, common culture, and common destiny. Hence the insane effort Lee put into joining Malaysia. Independent since 1957, Malaysia had the resources and market for products that Singapore needed to stay afloat, and they were happy for their island neighbor to join. In 1961, Lee met Malayan Prime Minister Tunku Abdul Rahman to discuss a merger between their nations, plus Sarawak and North Borneo. A tentative agreement was reached. Unfortunately, this alone was enough to make Singapore explode. While many backed PAP on Malaysia, a whole bunch of Chinese were terrified it could be their ticket to becoming a persecuted minority. That summer, a splinter faction from PAP formed the Barrison Socialist to campaign against the merger. So, Lee called a referendum which returned a solid pro Malaysia majority. But when riots then broke out, Lee decided to put an end to the Barrison Socialist once and for all. Launched in February 1963, Operation Cold Store was perhaps the first time Lee Kuan Yew showed just how far he was willing to go to keep order. Over 100 people, including all of Barisan Socialist's leaders, were arrested and held without charge, effectively locked up for opposing the merger. It was a glimmering of the hard authoritarian edge Lee would display all his life, but it also ensured Singapore would join the Malaysian Federation. On August 31, 1963, Lee held a special ceremony to mark the end of British influence over the islands and swear loyalty to Kuala Lumpur. Just over two weeks later, Singapore ceased to exist as an independent state, and a bright new future as part of a dynamic federation began. At least, that's how the script was supposed to go. In reality, Lee would barely have time to celebrate his greatest political triumph before it all came crashing down in flames. The reasons the Singapore-Malaysia Union collapsed are legion and vary depending on who you're talking to. But there are some common threads, from the staggering taxes Kuala Lumpur levied on the island to Lee's aggressive attempt to expand PAP's reach on the mainland. But perhaps the clearest thread running through every part of this disappointing tapestry was the issue Lee feared most of all race. To simplify a complex issue, the new Malaysia wanted to promote Malay culture, while Lee felt only an avowedly multicultural project could stop the peninsula from descending into ethnic violence. When two separate race riots paralyzed Singapore in 1964, killing 36 and injuring hundreds, both sides felt their worst suspicions had been confirmed. By summer 1965, tensions were no longer simmering so much as they were boiling over the edges of the pot and covering the stone in angry resentment. That June, things got so bad that Tunku Abdul Rahman basically went, you know what? To hell with this fool. The process of expelling Singapore from Malaysia was as swift as it was irreversible. While Lee was given a few days' notice to give the illusion that this was a mutual parting, it was a clear case of jump before you pushed. On August the 9th, 1965, Lee held a press conference to confirm what news had reported that morning that Singapore had left the Federation. To call it a shock would be an understatement. Most of Lee's cabinet hadn't even been told until less than 48 hours before the announcement. But that afternoon, it was Lee who seemed to be most shocked of all. Eyes glistening with tears, Lee asked his countrymen to stand firm, to believe that they really could survive as an independent state. Later, he would call that press conference his moment of anguish. 
and it's easy to see why. For the first time in modern history, this tiny, overcrowded island was now utterly alone. Alone in a dark, hostile world surrounded by larger powers. Unless he wanted to be remembered as the man who destroyed Singapore, Lee was going to need a miracle. Since we're living in a world where Singapore clearly didn't implode into ethnic violence, there's not much point in us structuring this chapter like a narrative, following Lee Kuan Yew as he struggles to make miracles happen. Instead, we're going to dive into the details of Lee's rule without regard for chronology, so you can see for yourself how he held his city-state together. One of the biggest issues the young country faced was his ethnic cocktail, one which had already produced two notorious race riots, with so many Chinese, Malay, and Indians all crowned together, Singapore was always going to be multicultural. But Lee surprised everyone by how far into that he leaned. Rather than favor one language or culture over the other, Lee's solution was to embrace aspects of all of them. Chinese, Tamil, and Malay were all made official languages, with English promoted as the lingua franca to bind them together. The calendar was stuffed with public holidays for all the major religions, with Christian, Muslim, Hindu, Buddhist, and Chinese celebrations sprinkled throughout the year. Perhaps most surprising, though, was housing policy. Under Lee, the Housing and Development Board, or HDB, became one of the most powerful government departments, eventually building homes for around 80% of Singaporeans. This is important, because many HDB blocks were given strict ethnic quotas intended to reflect the demographics of the country at large. In other words, an enforced multiculturalism that Lee intended to stop the formation of ghettos. Another big issue was poverty. If, uh, like me, you grew up long after Singapore became a byword for well-ordered and freakishly clean, it can be hard to imagine the state it was in when Lee assumed power. The people were poor, the streets dirty, tracts of land still scarred by war damage. Half the population was functionally illiterate. As one popular travel magazine of the era sniffed, utter filth and poverty one must see with his own eyes to believe it. Fast forward to 1990 and Singapore would be the second richest nation in Asia. So how did this happen? What potent ideology did Lee seize upon to transform this small tropical island? The answer? None. Grafted onto a European or American understanding of left and right, the Great Singapore Experiment can be laughably hard to quantify. Finance and the free market were embraced, along with low corporate tax rates and all sorts of incentives for international businesses to base themselves there. At the same time, though, Lee never forgot the lessons he'd learned from at Lee's Labour government in Britain. Certain sectors, such as housing, were dominated by powerful state monopolies, with a level of government intrusion into people's lives that would give most conservatives a heart attack. Most famously, this came in the form of social improvement campaigns. A hard bit and realist, Lee didn't trust his fellow humans not to be gross, so he employed a carrot and stick approach to stop citizens from doing everything from spitting or chewing gum to fly tipping and failing to flush the toilet. In this case, the stick was quite literal. Those who acted crude in public could be sentenced to not just fines, but also caning. Yet, for all its weird mishmash of what we consider right and left, it's hard to to deny that Lee's methods worked. Poverty rates plummeted, literacy skyrocketed, the city became cleaner, richer, and more orderly than the British could have ever dreamed. Back when we did our geographics video on Singapore itself, we talked in wonder about how such ideological opposites such as Margaret Thatcher and Deng Xiaoping could both visit and come away thinking, I want to do that. Yet, despite his own professed lack of ideology, in a weird way, you can see a consistent logic to Lee's decisions. A champion of what he called Asian values, Lee believed in putting the health of society above the rights of the individual, no matter who those individuals were. That meant coming down on corrupt government officials like a ton of angry bricks. It meant ensuring a high-wage economy for everyone in the public sector and creating a compulsory saving system for healthcare. There's a reason millions mourned when Lee Kuan Yew died in 2015, and that's because he faced a future where Singapore could have easily been poor or corrupt or just really, really divided. And instead, he created a safe, stable, and wealthy society. But that doesn't mean it was all a utopia. It's time for us to take a quick look at the darker side of life in Lee's gleaming metropolis, one marked less by great strides in living standards and more by creeping authoritarianism. Back in our opening, oh, we lumped Lee Kuan Yew in with some pretty unsavory characters. While that was mostly to demonstrate how different he was from other East Asian rulers in this era, it was also because he at least vaguely 
belongs in their group. No one, but no one can stay in power for over 30 years without having at least a mild authoritarian streak. And Lee's streak was sometimes a shade or two beyond mild. For starters, is Singapore functioned under some pretty strict limits on free speech and public assembly. It also featured a judiciary that was less than independent. While judges were free from obvious interference, they still towed the PAP party line on nearly all significant rulings. And speaking of PAP, it wasn't just Lee who became a permanent feature of the landscape. Despite technically being a multi-party democracy with free and fair elections, Singapore effectively became a one-party state. Between 1966 and 1981, not a single seat in parliament was held by a non-PAP politician. When a record 40% of voters backed opposition candidates in 2011, just 6 of 87 seats went to other parties. Part of the reason for this was PAP's ability to spot emerging new talents and co-opt them, bringing the best and brightest into the fold. Another was the party's genuine, enduring popularity. But at least part of it was due to PAP's vice-like grip over society. Not just central government, but local work brigades, residents, committees, and local associations. They all fell under its spell. To take part in civil society, you almost by default had to get involved with PAP. This meant a level of identification with the party that pretty much no one in the opposition could muster. And when they tried, it often meant trouble. Unlike a classic lock him up or shoot him authoritarian, Lee had a much more humane yet equally effective way of dealing with political opposition. Thanks to stringent libel laws, critics of the government could easily be hit with devastating lawsuits. Opposition stalwart J.B. Jayaretnam was repeatedly bankrupted by politically motivated rulings. From Lee's point of view, the reason for all of this was clear. Loosen things up in society just a little and the demons of ethnic strife or communist agitation might come howling out again. As he confessed in an interview long after after his retirement, I'm not saying that everything I did was right, but everything I did was for an honorable purpose. I had to do some nasty things, locking fellows up without trial. Still, sometimes this obsessive micromanaging of society spilled over into cartoonishness. Under Lee's tightly controlled rule, the specific types of trees that could be planted by roadsides were mandated, and the government even set up its own dating agencies to try and get high-quality graduates to reproduce. More seriously, an aggressive drive to stop families having more than two kids was so successful that it badly damaged the birth rate, leading to an ongoing demographic crisis. So, yeah, if you're used to Europe or America's focus on individual freedoms, life under Lee probably would have seemed stifling. A democratic hero he certainly was not. Yet Lee never really claimed to be a Democrat. He was always clear-eyed about what he wanted to achieve via his soft authoritarianism. And the results speak for themselves. In Lee's time in power, Singapore's life expectancy increased by 10 years. Literacy levels skyrocketed. GDP per capita went from relatively low to among the highest on the planet. While the nation he constructed would be one many outsiders found oppressive, William Gibson famously dubbed it Disneyland with the death penalty, it was also one in which its citizens were both extremely safe and often extremely comfortable. But perhaps Lee's cleverest move would have come at the end of his rule. Rather than simply staying in power until he died like most authoritarians, he did something that helped prepare this tightly controlled society for life without him. He willingly stepped down. Lee Kuan Yew's time as Prime Minister ended on November 28, 1990, when he handed the reins over to Go Chok Tong. Still, this wasn't the end of Lee's influence on Singapore. Like Deng Xiaoping in China, Lee may have vacated the throne, but he remained a significant power behind the scenes, first as the cabinet senior minister, and then in the specially created role of minister mentor. This way, he was able to keep a steadying hand on the tiller through all 14 years of Go's premiership, right into the early years of his eldest son, Lee Hsien Lung's on going reign. It was May 2011 before Lee finally surrendered any role in politics following a historic election that saw PAP's vote drop to its lowest level ever. By then, though, it was abundantly clear that the nation he had forged would be capable of carrying on without him. Lee Kuan Yew died on March 23, 2015, at the age of 91. As he breathed his last, it was at the center of an island nation that had utterly transformed in his nine decades. A one-time tropical colony that was now both a gleaming metropolis and one of the most avowedly multicultural nations on Earth. Today, it's hard to overstate the impact Lee had in his long life. As PAP's main visionary, he more or less created modern Singapore. The wealth, the safety, the limits on free speech, the luxurious lives of many inhabitants, they all can be rested at his feet. To be sure, the system he left behind isn't ideal. Inequality remains a problem, and government censorship has gotten even more hard-edged over the last decade or so. But when you look at the cards Lee was dealt after Singapore crashed out of Malaysia, and then look at the results, 
Well, it's hard to argue that he didn't play his hand spectacularly. Sometimes people like to talk about the idea of a benign autocrat, the leader who may hoard power but really does have their people's best interests at heart. Normally, this is just a comforting story dictators tell themselves, a handy fiction to cover their corruption and psychopathy. Yet Lee was the rare ruler who did fit this mold. Maybe his tactics were at times questionable, maybe he sometimes did some bad things. Without him, though, Singapore today would likely be a much poorer, much more divided place. He may not have been perfect, but Lee Kuan Yew was undoubtedly one very important thing. A visionary.